so we're going to talk about uh, band intros and attacks. And Bob had alluded to the answer to this one, so I'm going to let him tackle this. When you're listening to a band performance, what's the first thing you hear? Well, you hear the rolls. You know, first thing you hear is the pipe major counting out the, the beat. There you go. And then, the next thing you hear is the, the snares and how are they doing on the tempo. Yes. The pipe major just set. Right. First thing you hear is by the right quick march or some kind of variation of that. The pipe major's command sets the tempo, so you have to pay attention to the beat that's going on. That's the first thing that happens. And that's the first thing, even though I'm in the back, behind the drum corps, I, I listen to the pipe major's cadence in their voice before they start. I hear it listen for by the right quick march. And if I have an opportunity to, if they're marking time, I'll also listen to the mark time. But I won't count anything on the rolls that didn't with the marking time unless their voice matched that. So whatever their voice says, that's what I go by, and then the rolls, and then the tune. OK, what determines if the three beat rolls are effective? Are they being played at the tempo that was counted in? OK, they're starting to finish together. I would also say, uh, I think it's very meaningful, is the snare and the bass drummer playing at the same tempo. So the roll. Doesn't always happen. The, correct. <laughs> the rolls start and finish together. Good quality rolls, we talked about this earlier, consistent along the whole core and through the whole roll. I've heard this a lot where the rolls start okay, but the quality of the roll changes halfway through, like the buzzes open up, so it's towards the end. Or um, they'll speed up towards the end. They don't, they change rhythm, they change quality, they change volume, something. Or, you know, and sometimes some people do it and not others. So you have to be sure that the whole core plays the whole role the same way all the way through. Bass and tenors um, must be together on this. You don't want to hear a flam sound, if you will, from the bass and the tenor, right? If the bass is playing the beat, you don't want to hear. You hear it, which is one of the reasons why many people have the tenors ghost the, um, the roll off. They do not play the drum. It's one more thing that could go wrong. And a lot of times they don't think of that until it does go wrong. But almost every band I know from grade five up through grade one has the tenors ghosting on the roll off. And you know that's a great idea. Yeah, because the whole point of this is to get started with a nice consistent tempo. Exactly. Don't have to be fancy. I mean the rolls, yes, the rolls are used to give the pipes a chance to get up and start together and then you start doing all your fancy stuff. Yeah, there's really nothing it says that tenors should be playing those three bass rolls. But if you... They shouldn't be marked down if they don't. Correct. Yeah, it must be sustained to the final tap of the roll, too. We talked about that earlier. Finish the roll all the way through to the end. Don't jump in the second one. Yes, that's a good one, too. Don't jump in on the second roll. They have the nice, even tempo. Um, have the... That gap is what you said. That gap, the professionalism, the poise, the confidence to wait until the next roll starts. And that's okay to do nothing for an entire beat. Some drummers think they have to fill every single gap in, they don't. At the, at the final tap of that roll, that's when you want to hear the ease. Yes. You want to hear them, you don't want it, the, the pipe core sliding into the ease at that tap. Yes. You want a full volume E, just bang. Mm -hmm. as, soon as, so that, as soon as that stick comes down on the snare. Tap matches the E. Yep. And that second roll together. Doesn't the second roll start at the, 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 when the drones are straight? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the second roll should start on the drones. Yep. The second roll should end on the E. To demonstrate confidence. Yes. Okay, then, this is what we were talking about earlier. The tempo must be consistent from the start of the first roll into the first bar of the first tune. So you don't want the tempo to drop or speed up after the rolls. I hear a lot of times they get this really excited, they have this tempo in their mind, but then they get excited to start the rolls. They go too fast, and then they pull back to the tempo they had practiced the tune. So if that's the tempo you want to play the tune, that's fine, but start your rolls at that tempo, because you do get marked down for it. I, I tend to, if I, if I hear that being done well, I tend to comment on it. Say yes. It's good, you know, use uptake, I use that term, good mm -hmm. uptake into the, the march. Okay, now this is more of a discussion question. Are crescendos and diminuendos 
acceptable, gradually getting louder through the role, gradually getting quieter through the role, or whatever. I don't see why not. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. As long, again, as long as it's done well, consistent along the whole core, you don't want some people getting louder and some people staying the same volume. My school of thought, though, really is that don't make a big deal about it. Play it clean from start to finish, and then do all your fancy stuff once you're into the tune. Because it's one more thing to mess up. It's one more thing to have go wrong. I mean, but I, again, I think it's acceptable, done properly. It's really just a chance to get the pipes up. OK. Now this um, really comes into play if you judge outside of WUSPA. Because not every association has the rule that you have to start on three-pace rules. So if you're on the panel and you get asked to go judge in Ontario or in the East Coast or wherever, they are allowed to start on things other than three-pace rolls. Be prepared for it. What do you look for? We just talked about how you, all the stuff you look for if it's an attack with the three-pace rolls. Now what? What do you look for? What factors are you going to consider? Is it rhythmical? going to establish a tempo just like the rolls did. Just They're going to do some other way of getting into it. It might be a drum intro. It might be um, just striking the pipes up right away with the drum roll. There's a lot of things they could do, but make sure that it's establishing a tempo somehow. Played well together, obviously. If you're going to do something different, you better be good at it. Relating to the tune in a complimentary way. You can't just do something completely off the wall like have a little drum intro that sounds like you're about to play a jig, and then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden you go into a, s yeah, I would, I would think that going along with the establishing a tempo and playing, you know, relating in a complimentary way, if you did some kind of drum intro that made it seem like you're about to play a hornpipe or a jig, and then you went into a slow air. Yeah. You didn't really establish a tempo, and you gave us one feel and then changed it completely up for, for no real reason. And is it musically pleasing? So again, if you change tempos on it, was it musically pleasing? It comes down to music all the time. You look for those things, but if it's done well and it's musically pleasing and something you want to listen to, it's done well, if then it's consider, good. If, if you consider the, the, the title, you're introducing the band mm -hmm. to this judging panel and the crowd. So usually when people introduce themselves for the first time, they try to put their best foot forward. And that's exactly. kind of, you know, that's what you have to consider regardless of how you want that introduction yeah, to go. Yeah, pretend you're on a first date. You, know, you want to make sure that, that it's nice, crisp, and clean, and it presents the band in a, in a good way. Other than that, you know, if there is no, and there, and there is no rule that it has to start in a certain way, just start it to where you're doing a good job of introducing your band to a group that maybe hasn't heard you before. Exactly. Good way of putting it. Like you're introducing yourself to somebody for the first time. Exactly. Like a first date. Put your best foot forward. Do everything your best. OK. Again, something else that comes up all the time. Every single band and every performance has a, have, have breaks. What are breaks? Real simply, it's a transition from one tune to another, period. It may or may not include a tempo and or style change. A quick march medley, you might have a 4-4 four, four march into another 4-4 four, four march. You've just done a break because you've gone from one tune to another. You may, if you're not paying attention, you may not notice it in that instance because the tempo doesn't change. There's no major style change. They didn't do anything different other than go to a new tune. Scott and the Brave into Wings. If you're not paying attention, you may not notice there was a tune change. However, the biggest ones we have to worry about are um, the ones where people do change tempos and or styles. So what are some possible methods for establishing an effective break from an ensemble point of view? What are some ways that fans can do that? Silence. Sorry? Silence. Silence. Um, um, maybe a, a drum figure of some sort. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it could even be a, it could even be a crescendo roll, you know, something mm -hmm. like that that tells you that something different is going to happen. Okay, so we've just gotten done with this particular idiom. Now we're going to do something different. Mm -hmm. Here's some, again, if you're watching this, there's lots of right answers here. These are some examples. If you have some more, please feel free to put them on your exam and explain them nicely. 
time signature change, going from one time signature to another, establishing the new time signature. Tempo change, you're going faster or you're going slower, that's an and it's a definite effect. Um, may include a retardando or accelerando or fermata. Um, retardando means to gradually slow down, accelerando means to gradually speed up. Fermata is a hold, if you don't know those terms. Transitional passage or a bridge, this is very common now. And there's lots of ways people do it with various combinations of instruments, but they'll play an introduction with like a, the theme of the new jig before they play the full jig. Very common, or whatever. And we just mentioned this little drum intro. The pipers hold one note and the drummers do like a bit of a fanfare for a couple measures. Again, establishing the new tempo and establishing the new feel while the pipers are holding a note, and then they go into it. Um, for the drum corps, what are some of the possible options for the break? There's you know, a few things you can do. You can have the lead drummer all by himself, which a lot of people do because there's less chance of people, I mean, to be fair, even grade one, there's less chance of more people not getting the tempo correct right away, not getting the feel right right away. Lead drummer does it by himself, everybody else can join in later. Tenors can play by themselves, bass can play by themselves. Um, you could have nobody play. You could have the full drum corps come in for a nice effect if you're confident in that. Tires, just the snares. You could have no bass and tenors, just the snares come in. Bass only, tenors only, whole bin section, or any combination of the above. So you could have just the lead drummer and the bass drummer, or just. <coughs> the snare drummers and the tenor drummers, or whatever. Any combination you want. And of course, just no drumming at all in the break. Pipers can establish their own tempo and you can come in later. Okay, what factors make a good break? When you write down, good break, effective break to the, to the reel. What happened? Starting and stopping together. Starting it together. Clean and distinct. So basically, drummers together as a core and playing on time. There's nobody starting in different times. There's no establishing different fields with different tempos going on. They're right in there together. Tempo is controlled and not wavering. They're settled right away. They're not fighting for tempo. That, we hear that a lot. You go into a new tune, and somebody wants to go faster or slower than the rest of the group, and there's a little bit of fighting for a few bars, give or take, until they figure it out. You want it settled immediately. That's an effective break. It's gotta be crisp. Crisp. I like this one. All tempo changes should be intentional, not inadvertent. <laughs> that would never happen. No. So but you can do an accelerando, which you gradually get faster, but I would make it very obvious that I'm doing it on purpose. Not that we couldn't control ourselves. Did you say rushing? Yeah. Not, we're not rushing, we are planning, because we think it sounds good musically, we're trying to go faster or slower or whatever. Make, and if you do a weird tempo change, be obvious with it. If it's not obvious, you're gonna be, people are gonna think you did it accidentally, inadvertently. And of course, you have to play it well with the pipes. Whatever you're doing, drummers have to match the pipes and vice versa, but the whole chorus to work together. From an ensemble point of view, we wanna, have everything together. You can't talk about the drumming and not talk about ensemble. That's what we're doing. We're creating a lot of the ensemble effect comes from the drummers. Establishes the character of the tune immediately. This kind of comes along with the tempo, but if you go into a Strass Bay, you want to know the drummers are playing a Strass Bay on the first measure of that tune. You don't want them to wait to get into it. So there's a new feel. They're not like, oh, sorry, I'm playing a Strass Bay tempo, but I feel like I'm playing a march. You want to jump into it and feel like a Strass Bay or a jig or whatever right away. And you don't want anybody guessing as to what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want people to recognize the idiot. Yes, so that's one of those things that you have to communicate between the lead drummer and the pipe major. How exactly do you transition to it? How are you establishing a new tempo? There's lots of ways people hold notes while the pipe major maybe tap the beat before you start. Some people just hold the note and everybody gets the tune in their head and then they go into it and it works for them. 
There's lots of ways to do it, and uh, we talked earlier about the um, drum core establishing the tempo. If you're more comfortable, maybe the lead drummer is really good with that tempo. The piper just hold a note, the drum core starts playing, there's a tempo, then the pipe major brings his foot in after that, and then they keep going. Lots of ways to do that. Midsection. Define midsection. You hear this term all the time. What is a midsection? Bass and tenor. Bass and tenors. Bass and tenors and the different size of the tenor drums. We call them all tenor drums, but if you want to get all technical, there's alto drums, baritone drums, tenor drums. You know, there's a, maybe a, a bass tenor drum, if you will. And then, of course, the bass drum. All those different sizes, that whole combination together is the midsection. Correct. You can have more than one bass drum. Some so bands are starting to... Sounds like you two bass drums. <laughs> right head, left head. Um, yeah, so bands are starting to utilize the fact that the rules say minimum one bass drum. Now people are starting to use more than one bass drum, which is, again, done well, I'm okay with. Now, how can a midsection enhance your performance? Color. In today's pipe bands, you, yeah, they can do a lot. The way that innovative playing and um, styles and tunings and visually that the midsections are doing, they can enhance it a lot. There's, um, anyway, here we go. Can, and tonal, rhythmical, and visual. Those are the big things. We talked about that. The, the tuning of the drums, the rhythms they can play. The harmonic. The, yeah, harmonic, yeah, from the tones. Mm -hmm. that, so the tonal part, they can, not only you have the different pitches, but you can do combinations of tenor drums, and now they're creating harmonies, they're creating chords, chord progressions that are matching the bagpipes. They're not just, you know, it's like the left hand on the piano, matching up with the, with the melody going on. It's really nice. It increases the sound, the, the overall sound of the band just gets bigger if it's, if it's tuned well. Yes, you can fill out the band. Um, and of course, there's a visual aspect, some tonal. It enhances, it enhances the sound of the pipes. Tune properly, it enhances the bass drones, sorry, the bass drone, the tenor drones, the chanter, and the snares. Going back to your vi visual comment you made there, I think it's very important that you uh, see some really good stuff from tenor, where they're, they're actually the, the patterns they're playing is enhancing what, what the phrasing has been played by the snares. Not yes. all the time, just here. Right. Yeah, oftentimes, what I write down on my ensemble sheets if the tenors in particular are, are really flourishing well, is that I'll write down that they're doing a good job of visualizing mm -hmm. the And that's, yes. that's really, and to me, uh, you know, I've, I've had discussions with people as to whether you, you know, you give points to that, whether visualization, uh, the flourishing, uh, you know, adds anything to a band. And if it's done well, and it, it truly does uh, uh, add to the effect of the playing, then yeah. It's yeah. All actually, no, there's, it's hold all on. there's actually a, a, a visual section here. Just, you want to hold off until, until what, we get there? If I could just endorse your point. Uh, from, from real world, uh, close to me, I was judging a contest, and there was in between competitors, I was watching all the way across the other side of the field, I was watching a, a tenor drummer who shall be nameless, a very good one in fact. And she was playing, and without hearing anything, I could tell what she was playing. Just by the way she was flourishing. Exactly. Okay, so the, the tonal aspect right now, we're going to do all three. Mm -hmm. The tonal aspect fills in the sound. We talked about that. There's more of a range than you had before without them, without the tenors, without the midsection. And you have the different pitches. Um, depending on how many drums you have, you could have more pitches. You can have different combinations. You don't have to just hit one at a time. You could hit all together. Um, which is, ends up, I think of the um, tenor drums as two different ways, as like a bell choir. They could play one at a time playing the melody. I also think of them as a regular, as a singing choir. As you're playing, you have to blend your sound. Depending on how you strike your drum, you could stick out more. Depending on if you strike it differently, you could completely be hidden. So when I'm tuning up a tenor choir, after I get the, in, when I'm happy with the intervals, I do have them play in unison, because I do, almost every tenor choir eventually plays in unison. And I say, OK, let's blend it. You bring it out a little bit more. You back off a little bit more until it's one nice sound, as though you're listening to a choir singing, trying to match pitch and, and tune up. 
Um, then you can also hear the differences in intervals right away. And then I'll tell somebody to play out more of the strike the drum differently, strike the drum in a different part of the head until it all matches up. More color, you already mentioned that, different tones. They can also stop playing. And the people forget that. They feel like they have to do something all the time. They don't. They do all this really cool stuff, nice chords, different intervals, up and down, skipping around, playing their own little melody, and next thing you know, they stop. Creating excitement, they're wondering what's gonna happen next, and then they start playing again. It's wonderful. Rhythmical parts. Well, the bass, for example, will establish your time signature, the heartbeat. They hold the band together. First and foremost, that's what the bass drum has to do, period. All the other stuff we might talk about is secondary to you as a bass drummer holding the band together. And as a judge, that's what I look for. If the band's falling apart, I go right to the bass drummer and I say, you need to do more to help that. Especially if they're playing all sorts of syncopation and other accents that are completely unnecessary at this point in this band's development. The first thing I do if I see separation between the chords, I go right to the bass drummer and say, do your part. Or if I um, see a bass drummer trying their part, I'll get on the other chords for not listening to the bass who's doing a good job with that pulse. Create steadiness <clears throat> with the rhythm. Syncopation. Again, syncopation is just playing an accent that's not on the downbeat or the upbeat. So any other place that you do a heavy note, an accent which creates a nice effect, creates a little bit of tension before you resolve it back onto the beat. Lift. Lift, exactly. Can highlight the melody line. This is a relatively new development in the tenor drumming. Absolutely, you don't just, you're not just a drummer with the snare drummers, which you absolutely are, but you also have to pay attention to what the bagpipes are doing and match that melody at one point or another. Then you highlight the snare scoring too. Again, you are still a drummer. Sometimes what your rhythms can do can accent what the, the snares are doing, highlight their parts. And that can be by playing along with them or stopping and letting them play. Promotes the theme. And again, like you were just saying, you can tell that they're playing a strass bay. You can tell they're playing a jig by the, what they're doing. Create the theme of the, of the tune. Contributes to the ensemble with unison and split parts played cohesively. I think we alluded to this earlier, if you're playing split parts, da -ga -da, da -ga -da, da -da, boom. you can't, da -ga -da, da -ba, da -da. they have to be, play it like it's one, one rhythm, as though one person was playing, one person playing it on several drums. It has to be cohesive, or if they're in unison, same idea. Visual, we'd already alluded to some of this just a moment ago too represents the music visually. Visual representation of the music, like a conductor. I've, um, I was just watching on YouTube the other day, um, I think, I believe his name was Andy Miller, the old um, tenor drummer from Ontario, played with a lot of grade one bands there. There's a video of him playing in the Clan McFarlane. Oh, I know. And then it was... Yes. And if you watch, and the, whoever, it was some random person videoing just some random band, I believe, and they ended up focusing in on the tenor drummer because he was so good. And if you didn't know better, you'd swear the Pipers were getting their cues from him. And I think a lot of people forget that aspect of it. Music from the center, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. So everything you do visually should be representative of the music somehow. Just be I use the Jurassic Park thing all the time. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. So because you are, have the ability to do it doesn't mean you should, unless it enhances the music or in some way enhances your performance and you can do it well and all those other things to consider. Of course, there's flourishing. This, and this is how they do it, the, the various flourishes, which we're not going to get into all the different um, individual flourishes now, now because there's so many. But again, it's something that the whole core should be able to, the whole tether core should be able to do well together or else you shouldn't do it. Visual unison, so they do things together at the same time. And there's lots to, to take into that. The I take their entire body into consideration. What are they doing? Is their arm, is this, they're up? Is it up here? Is it here? Is it out here? I mean, or is it here? There's all sorts of things to consider. It didn't just kind of go to the right. You see this a lot. Sorry, whoever's watching. Teenage girls. <sighs> Whatever, I did it. As opposed to somebody who really puts time into their art. Yeah, controlling every aspect of it. 
um, split visuals. A lot of times they do things together, just like the split um, rhythms. Now they have split visuals. Not everybody has to do the same thing at the same time, always. I've seen, you know, the wave. People do ripple effects. People take turns. They do a thing where there's, you know, four or five tenors, and half the group does a up and half does down, and then they switch it. There's all sorts of wonderful things you can do, and that can relate to, I saw a group do a bunch of stalls where they came down, they took turns moving around the core, and it was a really cool up and down effect moving around, but because the drums are different pitches, you hear do 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 and it matched exactly what the, what the jig was doing. So it was a really cool effect, really simple moves, done well. And actually, I'm a big fan of tenor drummers doing really simple moves, really big, really well to enhance the music. I think, you know, <coughs> I would probably want to use uh, in a situation like that. Did it make me feel comfortable with the music? Or, or is there an uncomfortable feeling about it? That's, sometimes I think it's a valid comment. I just, I just didn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, somebody come up and say, What did you mean by that? And then, but they usually do it. And, and by the same token, you know, I've, I've written down, down things like. You know, in addition to doing a nice job of visualizing the idiot, I've written down things like adding some nice excitement to the band here. Yeah. Because it does that. You know, and if you see, like you say, if you if if you see those split visuals and things like that, I mean, that really and truly gives you the sense that that band is capable of of really creating this nice effect, and they're doing it together. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, it's not just the tenors that are doing it. Everybody's contributing to that. No accidental. And like, the, like you say, the tenors, are, they're almost like the conductor. That it, it, it looks like everybody's following them. And when that happens, then you know that all of those cores have got some nice unison to them. Exactly. Okay. We talked about, I mentioned some things here. What are the elements or some of the elements of creating a good midsection sound? And the tuning aspect, the playing aspect. Well tuned drums. You know, appropriate resonance. Make sure the drums ringing properly. No overtones. No unwanted overtones, exactly. You want it to ring so you can hear it away from right on top. It has to, or else you can't hear it when you step back. But you don't want to ring too much. You don't want it, and a lot of times the, um, unwanted overtones are because the head itself is not even, evenly tuned. Or the two heads are tuned to two diff to dissonant pitches. So that's where it comes from sometimes. That's the first thing I would look for. If it has an uh, unwanted overtone is I check to make sure the heads are even, then I check the pitches of both heads to make sure that they're not at dissonant pitches. Pitch of drums in tune with drones and chanter. Make sure that you're aware of what frequency the pipes are tuning at in your particular band that particular day. Intervals between the drums distinct and in tune with each other. It's just not just you know low, higher, highest, and you know it, they actually have a definite interval. Is it a third apart? Is it a fourth apart? Are you playing on the the tonic of the? Are you playing on the dominant? I mean, what are you playing on? Volume balanced, not too loud or not too soft. You want to be heard, but you don't want to be overpowering. It's a shame when sometimes people get so scared of overpowering that you can't hear them at all. I mean, you want to hear them. You want them to make a sound. That, that does happen. I've, it does. I haven't been in contests where I can't hear the tenors. I know they're doing something. Yeah, I see that. I know exactly what you mean. I see them strike the drum. I'm like, I'm waiting. Well, I can't give them credit for the tuning. I can't give them credit for anything because I can't hear it. I write down tenor inaudible. So they have to either strike it harder or with a different technique or with a different type of mallet or something so that I can hear what they're doing. Good control of the technique when they're striking the drum. Make sure that they're striking the drum so that it can be heard. Sound goes through the drum, out to my ears. Tim, have you, I don't know if it's a valid them to use or not, but I've seen some bands where there's really nothing going on in the flourishing department, but the tenors are kind of getting in the way. I'll, I'll say either, you know, tenors are supportive or tenors are unobtrusive. Unobtrusive. 
Fair enough. <laughs> but you know, that, that's not to say that they're is that same they, as they, no harm, they, no foul. They, no harm, no foul. <laughs> well, that happens a lot. I mean, they, they, they just want to get somebody out there to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good control of dynamics. Again, with the core, a lot of times people forget that. The snares work in dynamics. They have these big rolls. They have these really quiet passages and these loud passages, and it sounds really good. But the tenors play the exact same volume all the way through. They miss that, especially the accenting. They just play you know, straight eighth notes or straight quarter notes or whatever, and they forget to give emphasis where, where it's needed to be given. Yeah, you often take <coughs> quite a volume mismatch across the core. Exactly. So when you're listening to it or, or working with a group, make sure that <coughs> that is addressed. Okay, and also appropriate hardware. You know, mallets, heads, drums, and whatnot. Um, sometimes the combination of heads and drums and mallets you're using or, or whatever are an issue. Maybe the, the mallets are too soft, so it's not coming through. Maybe they're too hard and it's coming through too much. Maybe this is what and we talked earlier, maybe you're striking it wrong. Maybe you have too much muffling in your drum. Maybe you have not enough muffling in your drum. They have heads now that have just the right amount built in. I like those. Um, but nonetheless, you just have to make sure that those things are in place. Snare drum scoring. Hang on. Before you go on to this subject, one, one last thing that I mentioned about, about the midsection. Sure. Is that to me, when a band starts, uh, <clears throat> one of the techniques I use as an ensemble judge is I pay particular attention to how the midsection sounds. Because the midsection, I think you put it very appropriately that the bass drummer in particular is the heartbeat of the band. So you're kind of looking at the internal workings of the band when you're paying attention to that midsection. And I always look at the midsection as a group that can, can really provide some excitement to the band and one that can really scrape a lot of points off of the table. The points are there to be had, all they got to do is take them. Mm -hmm. And a good midsection will always do that. You know, they will always provide an extra oomph to a band. They're not, you know, there, there was a time when, when a tenor section in particular was more of a decoration than a musically integrated unit. Now it's a musically integrated unit, and it adds a tremendous amount to a band. And like I say, to me, that's always the that's always the section that I look to fairly early on in a contest to see whether I'm dealing with a band that can really and truly put the whole thing together. If there's a strong if there's a strong midsection playing then I know I'm dealing with a, a musical group that really knows what they're up to and I've got to really pay attention to them. Yes, the, actually music theory knowledge in a tenor section is more critical than ever, ever as far as tuning and overtones and um, the overtone series, if you will. There's all sorts of things that have to be considered when, when doing that. So those guys and girls have to study a lot to know what they're doing. It's not just high boom and low boom anymore. Yeah, and the, and, and the real thing that, that I look for when I'm judging a band and looking at the overall sound and the quality of that sound, of course, is that timbre. And the midsection is one of the groups that really pulls that out. You know, am I listening for something that's plain vanilla or has it got hot fudge on it? And the midsection's the hot fudge. You know, that's really and truly what I'm looking for. Don't tell anyone you said that. No. <laughs> I'm afraid it's been. Yeah, I'm afraid it's been recorded. Uh, it might have, may have been. I know some tenors that think they're the sprinkles, but that's okay. No. No, I'm just joking. No. no the very, very substantial part of, of yeah. the integration, yeah, the amount of musical excitement a good midsection can create is absolutely immeasurable. I think that's the right way to put it because that's. I I do get excited when I start hearing a midsection that's really adding to the performance. I said, okay. Absolutely. Now I've got something that's, that's really, that's, that I really got to pay close attention to because they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the difference between a good section and a bad section could be if they're just playing straight quarter notes, but as you look at them, you know that those are the coolest, most exciting quarter notes in the world, and they are happy to be playing them today for you. Well, as opposed to, whatever, I'm here, I did it, what do you want? I hit the drum on time. 
And, and, and it's, I've seen both types. And it's, like, it's like anything else, too. You have to be careful not to overdo stuff to the point where a lot of the accompaniment becomes busy. I mean, I, I, I make that comment sometimes with harmonies. Sometimes a pipe section will overdo harmonies. You know, a little bit of it goes goes a long way, and it's it, it adds, uh, and, and it's it, it's it's very nice to listen to. But just like anything else, you can overdo harmonies. You can also overdo the now that that midsections have got the capabilities that they have. You sort of have to want to make sure that you that you don't overdo it. That all of a sudden you go from from pleasingly music musical to intrusive. Correct. We're still unobtrusive. <laughs> yes, you don't want to be obtrusive. Nobody, nobody wants to be obtrusive. <laughs> okay, anything else on those? Okay, moving on to the next subject, scoring. This is something that ensemble judges and drum, drumming judges deal with. You know, the, is, are the scores, are these good scores? What makes a good score? When you say good scores for this group, good scores for this grade, what, what are we saying? What makes a good snare drum score? That's normally what we're talking about is the snare drum score, especially at first. What makes... Does it suggest, just, does it suggest the music? So. Does it keep the music in mind? Yeah. What do you look for as an ensemble judge with the scoring? I look to see if the score that the, that the snares are playing complements what the pipers are doing. Mm -hmm. In other words, does it add some, some color and some lift to, to, to what the pipe to what the pipe is playing? the key phrases? Yes. Okay, here's some of the suggested, you know, possible good answers here. There's absolutely more good answers. Or when you must. Okay. Well, first of all, to make a good score, you have to study to have a deep knowledge of the idiom. You can't just put a bunch of stuff on a paper. I don't mean you have to study for 20 years, but you have to know the idiom well enough to try to create it and not just what well, fit in the time signature. That's how we get the um, stress bay jig thing going on. must have technique. You have to have the tools to do the job. You have to be able to play what you're writing. And then these are the factors that determine the quality of the drum score. Makes the tune sound better. That's kind of what you guys were saying. It has to follow the tune. Follows the variations of the tune. A lot of times, the, you know, the repeat of the second part or the fourth part or whatever have a variation. Make sure the drum score changes for that variation. Does it provide the right amount of lift you're looking for? There's a theme created. Again, you're matching the idiom, the type of tune you're playing. You have a theme, I mean, are you playing a strass bay? Are you playing a march? Are you playing a jig? They should be very different things. If you're listening to just the drummers play, you should know what kind of tune they're playing. Does it also have a, a good mix of rudiments in it? Does it have good variety? Good variety, yeah. Variety. Um, variety of techniques, embellishments, rudiments, um, to keep it, you know, from being uh, monotonous, to keep it from being boring. Um, you can make different sounds for different techniques, and you add, you know, flam one place, a drag another, to to embellish it. And you know, again, the different rudiments. Unison parts. Mm -hmm. Appropriate unison parts. Good dynamics. Making sure that it again, it's emphasizing the strong parts of the tune. Um, back maybe. Backing off, let the pipe sound. You use of accents. Accents. You just mentioned the chips earlier, unison parts. Make sure that the chips that the drummers are playing are appropriate for the tune. It's not just doing it because they can do it. Does it sound good? Is there a reason for it besides we can play it? Complexity of the score. This is a big one. Not too much or too little. And sometimes it's not even about your ability to play it. It's about is it um, appropriate for this tune? Just because you can play something really, really complex doesn't mean you should. I have marked groups down for, even though they played something really okay, pretty, pretty good, I've marked them down because what they were doing did not match, match the music at all. It was just a bunch of random notes thrown into a measure that they started and stopped at the same time as the pipes. The only point I would offer on that is, um, regarding complexity, is um, and as the, the grade levels goes up, then more is expected. Correct. More complexity, still played with the right degree of control. Yes. 
complexity. Yeah, but I don't like, whether you're a grade one or grade five, I don't like complexity for the sake of throwing more stuff in. It still has to fit musically. I've heard grade one bands play really simple things that were very effective at certain places. Um, again, it's appropriate for the tune. Sometimes people put too little in. Like, you should be doing more than that. So the opposite is absolutely true. So if you are a grade one band and you're playing something way too simple for the group and it's not enhancing it musically, if you're doing something simple because it's musically enhancing, that's one thing. If you're doing something simple to avoid playing something harder, that's another thing. And this is something else to consider. Appropriate for the level of your ability in the drummers in your core. I hear it all the time. They, somebody has some ego where they want to play something really, really hard. And they have a, a problem with, and they, they use these terms called dumbing it down and watering it down. Making it more playable for your group is not called dumbing it down. It's called being more musical. It's no, besides that, it's no fun. I don't want to listen to it. I don't want to play it when I know it's going to sound bad. You, you eliminate that aspect of, oh, no, here it comes. Oh, man, it's going to, here it comes. And then and eventually that part gets messed up, and you're just thinking about how you're going to mess it up, and you think about how you just messed it up, and you're not enjoying your performance. So I like going playing, especially in the lower grades, playing simple stuff, playing it well with a lot of confidence, lots of dynamics, and making music out of it. And, but that's true in every grade. Just because you're in grade one doesn't mean you should play something 10 times harder than your group can handle. It's the exact same rules. Well, you know, your, your weakest player is your weakest link. Exactly. Play to the weakest. That's a piper, a drummer. It doesn't make any difference. If if that if you're going to compete with that individual, you need to make sure that the level of the music is appropriate for that individual. Because otherwise, you're always going to fight it. Exactly. And you know, in a grade one band, your weakest player still might be pretty good. It's not. It's not about that. It's just you have to consider your group always. Okay. Moving on, these are some things that are going to be on the exam you have to know about the constituents of music. You know, these generally, um, I've known people, it's just a little note on here, you might want to make flashcards for some of these definitions. As you're going back through, uh, we talk about things, make flashcards and study them so that you know what's going on. When you get to the exam, you're not racking your brain. So these are the three constituents of music you're going to have to know about. Rhythm, melody, and harmony. Rhythm. You can use your own words. You don't have to memorize this verbatim, but this is what the textbook answer is. The regular recurrence of strong and weak accents arising from the division of music into regular metric, metrical portions. Not much to say about that. Just learn that. You can use your own words. If you have another way of saying it, that is absolutely fine. But, but learn, but know what you're talking about when you get to this part of the test. Melody. An orderly succession of single, different sounds progressing horizontally, achieving a distinct musical shape. So the melody is just the main notes of the tune you're listening to. And it goes up and it goes down. It goes down, it goes up. The shape of the music is when it goes up and down. <clears throat> Harmony. This is just complementing the melody. The simultaneous combination of two or more sounds progressing vertically. So as the melody goes up and down, you'll have notes at each place, making it sound better, enhancing it musically with a proper chord or, what, or some note or sound that enhances it. OK. The next section we're going to work on is the section that gives a lot of people some of the most trouble. So please, um, if you're not comfortable with this section, please pay attention. F pay attention to the rules I give you and try it. And again, this is not intended to be all-inclusive. If you need some help with it, please go get help um, before you take your exam. This is to identify things that you might be strong in and might be weak in. I'll give you some help. But hopefully this will point out to you what you um, need to go work on and develop on your own. This is the music writing section. And we're, I'm going to demonstrate to you how I approach writing the music. And I'm going to do a mini um, mock demonstration of the exact way the exam will take place. The way it basically happens is everybody in the room will take turns playing two bars of various time signatures and various tune styles, 2-4 march, 4-4 four, four strass bay, 6-8 six, six, jig, or whatever. And then everybody in the room has
has to write it down with a pencil and turn that in for, uh, for a grade. You can hear it as many times as you want, but you still have to write it down completely from just a blank sheet of paper, no help at all. So I'm going to give you some steps to keep you organized during that process, which can be confusing if you try to jump ahead, so please try to stay with my steps. Okay, first rule for notating music that I have, write all the black dots first. In other words, if I hit the drum six times, you write six black dots. It doesn't matter what the rhythm is yet. And also remember if you hear a roll, that the roll will have two dots, one for the beginning of the roll and one for the end of the roll. So for example, if I play this rhythm, how many times did I hit the drum? One, two, and three, and Ten times I hit the drum. So you would write ten dots on the page, period, and their stems. Then you connect all the dots, I'm sorry, connect all the groups by their beats. So you listen and play the score while tapping your foot. Whenever you tap your foot, whatever note is playing at that time, that is the start of the new group of notes, period. Doesn't say what the rhythm is yet. All you know is that you're going to group these notes by beat and you're going to have each group started when your foot comes down. So if I play, my foot's tapping. So every time I did that, that's the start of a new group. It could be a group of one, could be a group of two, three, four, could be a group of eight, doesn't matter. Number three, then you go through and add embellishments, flams, drags, rolls, roll signs, whatever you need. So in that case, I just played, there was no um, embellishments, but if I put flams on it, I wouldn't be putting those on until this step. Now I add the flams. Okay, lastly, you're going to add the rest of the flags to the notes. So you're going to be grouping them by beat, and then you're going to be um, finishing off the rhythms. Okay, so let me play one more rhythm for you, and then I'll show you how I do it. Make it really simple. I'm going to play one measure of 4-4 four, four time. So if you can see my screen here, I'll make it a 4-4. Four, four. And I'm going to play. And then I add that many dots. Period. Secondly, I go through and find out where the groups are. I tap my foot. First group was right here. Second group was right here. Third group was right here, so I'm going to group those together. So this was where my foot came down. And I group those. So now I have a group of one, a group of two, a group of four, and a group of one. Here's the beat. Now what I have to do is figure out the rest of the flags. They have to break it down by, by meter. The first note is a quarter note. It's done. Second one, two eighth notes. I just played two notes on that, on that beat. I didn't have any extra holds. I didn't do any dots. I didn't do any cuts. So that one is done. Now, third beat. Right now we have four eighth notes, but I played faster than that. Matter of fact, I played twice as fast. Twice as fast. And we know from the chart we saw earlier, going from eighth notes to sixteenth notes, you go twice as fast as you move down that chart. So then you add one more flag to this. Then the very last note is a group of one. So that's how I'd go about that. Now if there are flams on it, I wouldn't add those until just before that last step. So I'll do one more with the flams in it. So again, how many times did I hit the drum? 
that many times. Then I group them. I tap my foot. There's the first group. I tap my foot on the third note. There's the next one. Tap my foot on the fifth note. And then I tap my foot on that last note. Then I add flams where they belong. First flam. Second flam. And now I would add any other flags. So I double check and play it again. Do I need any more? In this case, I don't need any more. So I'm done with that measure. So at this point, are there any questions about what I'm doing so far? Pretty straightforward? OK. So the next step is I'm going to simulate the exam. I'm going to have Tom play some measures similar to what we do in the exam. And I'm going to write them down for you just like you have to do when you do the exam. So you won't have to do it in this program necessarily. Though. Oh, good point. Yeah, I'm just doing it on this program to help you see it. But you're going to have a blank piece of paper and a pencil or a pen to write it down with for the exam. So you don't have to use the program, nor will you be able to use a program during the exam. What is that program called? Uh, Drumscreve. Drumscreve 2.0. But it's very good. It's very good output. When you're done, it's very professional looking music. It's I call it my big fancy pen. It does a good job of making it look exactly how I want it to. I can move it around as I, as I see fit. OK, so we're going to transition here very quickly. Tom's going to come play what I ask him to. Uh, this will be a mini version of what the exam will be like. OK, the first thing we're going to do is you're going to play two bars of a 2-4 march. And I'll move down here. And whenever Tom's ready to play, and again, he'll play it over and over again. During the exam, you get to hear it as many times as you want. And when it, you take a turn playing as well. When it's your turn to play, you still have to write down what you play. Um, and it's not an exercise in who can play the hardest thing. It's an exercise in just um, writing the music. So you're asked to play anything from a basic you know, score that any grade four band can play, up to something a grade one soloist might attempt. But also realize it's not your show off time during that event. So write down something that everybody should be able to write, to be able to play something that everybody should be able to write relatively easy. OK, Tom? Uh, two bars of a two four march. Play it one more time. No, I did the first time. Yeah, I'm just double check when the flames are. OK, so we just played. Uh, first step, all I did was write down all the, the big notes. Da, 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 So now the next thing I do is group things. Oops. Those are appropriate groups. Next thing I'll do is add any embellishments. So there was a roll there. Can you play it one more time and double check the flames? Oh, sorry. Flames there, and you had an flames. and you had an accent mm -hmm. right there. Okay, so then in this bar here I just highlighted, he played a triplet on the first half of that. So I'm going to group that as a triplet. Then I went back to dot and cut feel. Oops, excuse me. And then he continued dot and cut feel. <laughs> and then we have pickup notes here that are also dot and cut feel. That's it. Correct. Thank you. Um, and don't I know there's pickup notes in this, which is perfectly fine. This isn't the end of the tune. You don't have to worry about um, 
prorating this last measure because we would, we would go on. And nobody's going to ask you to do that. So yeah, so play it one more time, Tom. Let them see, read along as you do it. That's it. And also on the exam, the this week every exam is different because people play it. There will be an audio recording of the, all of the um, performances, so whoever is grading the exam will know what you're playing. Sticking is not as important as the correct rhythms. So if I wrote down a left hand here or a, he played a paradiddle and I didn't see it or notice it, that's okay. So don't stress that so much, but make it normal sticking patterns. Okay, so then the next thing you hear is, I'm gonna play two bars of a 4-4 four, four Strass Bay. So this one will be a little bit longer because it's two bars of 4-4, four, four, so there's twice as many beats now. Play something they can remember. So, yeah, nice and simple. Okay. Next thing Tom is going to do is play two bars of a 6-8 march. Okay, and play that a couple times so everybody can hear it. Okay. okay, so again, I just go by how many taps he hit the drum. Doesn't matter rhythm yet, I just look, I got as close as I can to the hands. And he played some rolls, so I played, like the first thing he played here was a roll. The first note of the roll is here, second, or the ending note of the roll is here. So I have to be aware of that as I'm counting the dots. And then I grouped them, he played buzz da da. And then my next time my foot came down, he was right here. Buzz da da. Next time my foot came down, he was here. Da buzz da. Next time my foot came down, he was here. Buzz da da. So we have the groups now. And the roll, now this is what we do, embellishments, rolls, flams, whatever. So he has several rolls on this one. So there's a roll here, roll here, roll here, and a roll there. We will put the roll sign on them. Now we have to pay attention to anything else. It's a, um, Dots and cuts. It's a 6 8 march, so very common. This rhythm is very prevalent in 6 8 marches. Oops, excuse me. And that is continued through this one. So he, the roll was extended, then cut short, going to the, the last note of each um, group, note grouping of each beat. And that was the same here, we just reversed where the roll was. He held that note longer and then cut that roll shorter, held this roll longer, and then cu cut shorter to the last note. So with the pickup note, and then all this roll pattern. So one more time, please. And that's what it sounds like, and that's what it looks like. And that's the pattern I go through every single time I write something. Let's do it. Let's try a couple more. How about a 2-2 two, two reel? Can you scroll up? Can you scroll everything up? Yes, I can. No, what? Hold on, let me get rid of that too. Oh, sorry. All right. How? Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is a two-two reel. Okay. Mm -hmm. One more time, please. Okay, so I got all the dots there. I'm comfortable with that. For some reason, that just popped up. That's where my dickies come out. I know. <laughs> I'm going to cut that. Okay. Let's move it around a little bit. Okay, so now this is 2 2, so we have to be aware that sometimes um, what seems like the second half of the beat is going to be now a quarter note not an eighth note. I've known more than one person that messed this part up. So da, da, ga, da, ga, da. the and in this case is the quarter note. So we have to be aware not to group two quarter notes together because then they look like eighth notes. So 
and then group that. Now these, these three notes here are really part of the same beat, but because there's a quarter note, we have to leave them separated. So we actually have two choices here. Because it's 2-2, two, two, we can either group all four of these together or group them separately. I'm going to choose to group all four together because it, feel, it looks like more of the same beat then. But if I didn't connect all four, it would still be appropriate. But I'm choosing to put them all together. Da, 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 buzz, da. Play one more time. Okay. Buzz, da, 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 da. Buzz, da, da. Buzz, da, da. So, again here, we have another case where there's going to be a quarter note in the group. But it's on the other end, sorry. There we go. Does da 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 da. Again. Yeah, these four can be together. There we go. Okay, then we go through and add embellishments. So there was a, I believe there's a flam at the beginning. There was an accent there. There's a roll here. Was there a flam there? Play it again. There was a flam right there. Okay, so now we have to go through and add anything else. Dots and cuts, extra lines. So this is definitely a dot and cut feel. So we're going to dot this and cut that. Again, it's not, we're not going to put, um, we're not going to group it like that because it's in 2-2 two, two time, not 2-4 time. And here, we're not going to do that, again, because it's in 2-2 two, two time. So that has to go away. Dot and cut it. Because we had the dot and cut feel all the way through. And your roll sign there. Again, dot and cut. Dot and cut. cut. And I'm thinking I'm missing one accent. Play it one more time. And there we go. So sometimes you have to really concentrate on exactly where the beat falls when you're tapping your foot, so, which is what you just saw there. I, I played around with it for a little bit, and I, and I figured it out. The, two, two, the grouping, that's, that's what you're talking about. That yeah. Is, uh, you've got to watch that one. Yeah, the grouping of a 2-2 two, two definitely um, looks weird, because this is one full beat right there. This is one full beat right there, even though it looks like two separate beats which is why I choose to do it this way instead of separating them. So I don't break them into half beats, I break them into um, single beats. Okay, so let's try, can we do a 2-4 hornpipe? Like an even hornpipe? Where are you gonna start this one? Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna. Take it all the way to the top if you can. Okay, you know what, I'll do it right here. You play uh, an even one? Oh. And like an even hornpipe? An even hornpipe? Yeah. Like, for example. Like. Okay. Or something. There we go. Okay. 
All right. So now instead of dot and cut, there's a very even feel to this one, so we don't have to worry about dots and cuts. But ever, we are back in two four time. So the groupings are going to look a little different than they did in two two time. So first thing we did is direct down all the dots. Then we're going to start grouping them. If you're tapping your foot as Tom played that, but he had it very syncopated, so your foot isn't necessarily going to come down where the, the accents were. So again, accent was right, the foot came down there, we're going to group that. Foot came down right here, so we're going to group that. And one too many dots. Okay, and then there's a unique, another unique situation. We have a lot more notes in this group than we ever have previously. So that actually is a group of six. Okay, so then we go back through and put the embellishments, right? And those places, I believe. Play that again, please. And then a drag. All right, so then we go through here. Now the embellishments are all there. We go through and make these um, musically correct. We have four notes in this group, and they're all even. So therefore, they're going to be 16th notes. Same thing with this group. It just feels odd syncopated because of where the flams fall. Now here we run into a unique situation because it's broken into two half beats, but we're going to group it all in one big group, but we're going to keep this part separated. He was playing all very even up until that drag. So that part there are just two, one E, two notes that are very even on the first, first half of that beat, and then he sped up. Matter of fact, he went twice as fast. The first time we've seen this as a group is 30 second notes. So you group it again, and one more time. And that is the phrase that Tom just played. Play it one more time so they can see it. That's it. OK, and we're going to do just one more. I'm going to do two bars of a 6-8 jig, something with some subdivisions or something. Do one more time. Okay, so now here actually I'm going to change this note, I can already see what's happening, because it's a compound time. So now we have a quarter note and an eighth note needed to fill up that gap. So even though these two are separated, this right here, that's blue, is one note grouping. Because there's one, uh, as we talked about earlier, 6 8 that's in compound time. The actual beat note here would be a dotted quarter note. So, quarter note plus an eighth note equals a dotted quarter note. Okay, and then the next group we did here. Then the next measure felt like two triplets to me. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Actually, I think a different sticky. Okay. Okay, so then we go back, look for any any embellishments. I believe we start with the flam. 